Now there's a reason that it has to be so small. The reason is, quite simply, that if you want to make something very fast, you don't want to spend a lot of time shuffling the data across the chip. So that's why the drive for computers is to make them smaller, not just so that they fit in the pocket, so that they're faster. And here we can see a chip in action. And what we're actually seeing, every time the lights come on, we're actually seeing which bits of this chip are actually processing the data. It's almost look like looking at a flow of traffic through a city. We're seeing which of the roads are actually carrying cars at any particular moment. But all that's just technology. What does physics say about the ultimate limits of data processing? How fast are our lives going to get using these high-tech devices? That's what we're going to start to look at now. First of all, we have to see not only how fast a computer is, how fast is a communications network in general? Well, here I've got set up a program that will actually just send a message somewhere in the world. It's actually sending it to Minneapolis, sending it to Minnesota in the United States. So if I press return on this, so what's happening is that this machine is actually sending out a message actually four times and timing the flight of the message to the United States and back. And here's the average down here, 116 milliseconds, 0.116 seconds. That's quite fast, go all the way to Minneapolis and back. But if we work out how long it would have taken light to travel that same distance, it actually works out to be 30 milliseconds, which is 0.03 seconds. So the message actually only travelled about a quarter of the speed of light. So while it's fast, it's not quite fast enough. There's plenty of room for improvement. But why can't we send messages at the speed of light? Well, let's have a look at what happens when you try to send messages quickly. For this, I need your help. In fact, I need the help of two rows in the audience up here. Now, you two rows, what I'd like you to do is I'm going to show you two on the end a message. I want your neighbours to turn away. Just have a look. Memorise it. Pass it back. Right. I'm going to come down to the front. Now, you two rows are two communications links. And when I say go, I want you to whisper the message to your neighbour and pass it on. And when it gets to the end, put your hand up. Okay? You two at the end. So, ready? Are you ready? Put your hand up if you're ready. Great part of the network's ready. Okay? <laughs> One, two, three, go. Now it's a race. Because we're all trying to decide which network to subscribe to. So come on. Get that message down. Oh, oh I think this row won. Okay. Now, could you tell me what the message was? A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E. You're both wrong. Not by much. A, B, D, C, E. So you can see what happens when you try to send messages quickly. Errors creep in. That's why taxis and other people who use mobile communications often say, th often say things like Alpha Foxtrot Romeo. They make the message longer. They're trying to say AFR. They make the message longer to try and correct any errors, to, el to at least reduce the possibility of introducing errors. So we can see that there's some kind of limit on the actual transmission of the data. But when we send a message from London to Minneapolis, we're not only passing through optic fibres and through satellite links, we're passing through some machinery, some computers that are actually going to route this data. So how can we make the machines faster? Well, the machines are made of silicon. 
or at least the active bits of them are. And silicon is nothing other than sand. So scientists are currently looking at other materials that might actually have faster transitions for their electrons between levels, that might actually make faster transistors for computers. And here are some of the things they've come up with. The lump of coal. It's actually the carbon in this has some very interesting and possibly useful electronic properties. The cling film. Actually, this is made up of polymers. And these are very long molecules. These can act like wires in a circuit. And here's a bit of spinach. Now, personally, I don't like spinach, but I wouldn't mind it in a computer if it made the computer faster. It turns out that the molecules that make spinach spinach actually have some very fast electronic processes in them. And that could be very useful for future computer technology. So that's one thing you could do. You look for new materials. There's another thing you could do. You can try and get these electrons to behave properly. Now, each of these chips contains lots of electrons doing lots of things. If you could get the electrons to all behave together as a crowd, to group together, not only might that be good for storing data, you actually might be able to pass on data throughout the computer quickly without introducing the kind of errors we saw up there. And this is where scientists are turning to quantum physics to look for possible ideas. I'm going to show you an effect of quantum physics, which is currently being investigated to actually include in computers. Now, what Elia is bringing on is a tray containing something called a high temperature superconductor. That's that grey blob in the middle. But the high temperature superconductor only behaves as a superconductor at very low temperatures. That's why he's poured in liquid nitrogen into this. Because what happens is as follows. As you lower the temperature of this superconductor, the electrons in the material get a chance to actually act as a crowd. Usually they're kind of being buffeted around by the other atoms in the material. But when you lower things down in temperature, they can act as a crowd. In fact, what they do, and hence the word superconductor, is that this crowd is so strong that it can kind of march through the material without any resistance. In fact, that's the key. No resistance. It's a superconductor. And we're going to see what the effect of that is. Because if there are electrons marching around as a group, that's actually like a current. And the current gives rise to a magnetic field. So I'm going to put on these goggles. And we're actually going to check out what magnetic field and whether there's a magnetic field coming out of this material. And therefore, if it's acting as a superconductor. What I'm taking here is a tiny magnet that I'm actually going to place on top of the superconductor. Ooh, although I tried to place it on top and it's actually floating. Now this is bizarre, but that's what you get in the quantum world. So that's where things are at. That's what scientists are trying to do, to speed up electronics communication. But what does nature say would be the ultimate limit? 